Welcome everybody. Thanks Lavinia for accepting our invitation to talk here today. Lavinia is a full professor at Heidelberg University since the beginning of 2022. She earned her PhD in Geneva University in 2014, and then she was an Ordita Fellow in Stockholm for one year. After that, she had a fellowship at ETH Zurich for three years as a postdoc, becoming then an assistant professor there thanks to her ERC grant. Today, she will present the model independent solution to the cosmological tensions. Lavinia, you can start when you're ready. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me here today. So yes, my attempt will be to try to um, discuss uh, how we could try to find the model independent solution to cosmological tensions, specifically to two relevant um, tensions that I considered here. So this is um, based on a work in collaboration with um, my previous postdoc, Hector, and my PhD student, Jan, who is about to finish um, his PhD. And so he's looking for, for a postdoc position. Uh, he's an excellent researcher. So in case um, you're looking for excellent postdocs, Jan would be available. And if you want to also have more information, uh, you can, for instance, have a look at this um, at this paper here. OK, then let me start. Um, so as you might know, in cosmology, we describe or try to describe the entire universe using two fundamental pillars. The first one is the assumption about general relativity. And the second is the cosmological principle, uh, which is the assumption that the universe on cosmological scales is homogeneous and isotropic. This has then um, immense uh, implication for the metric, which simplifies enormously and has then this very simple form. Uh, as you can see, the special part of the metric now uh, is given by this scale factor that is time dependent. There's an important um, quantity that we can also derive from that, which is the Hubble function. And as you can see, it's nothing else but a dot over a, and this gives you the expansion rate. Actually, from this Hubble function, we can uh, get a very important, a central uh, cosmological parameter, which is the H0 parameter. And so if you evaluate this function today, you get this H0 parameter. And you can also write this um, in this convention here with, with this small h. So during my talk, I will be changing between the big h0 and the small h, uh, representing basically the same thing. So uh, since, as I was saying, this parameter h0 it plays really a central role in cosmology, my first question will be, um, how do we determine, how do we measure this Hubble function? So we would like to determine that and through the Hubble function, basically this parameter. So how can we measure uh, H of A? Um, and so for that, uh, let us remind ourselves that there is a direct relationship between the redshift and the scale factor, given just by the simple formula here, where this is the redshift. And also a very important um, physical quantity is the co-moving distance. And the co-moving distance, as you can see here, is this integral uh, over the redshift divided by this inverse Hubble function. And so here you can already see uh, by measuring um, distances, you can obtain the Hubble function. So for instance, if we um, take this co-moving distance and we concentrate on very nearby objects, uh, we could basically take this expression and we could um, tailor expand it um, in small redshift. And, and as you can see, the leading order contribution uh, from this uh, goes at redshift divided by H0. So once we know the redshift information of a given object and the co-moving distance, we can from that determine the H0 parameter. And this is supposed to be roughly a, a model independent uh, um, estimation of the H0 parameter. So this is essentially what we are doing. And for that, we are, for example, using a very specific type of stars, the Cephates, 
um, these are like pulsating, um, periodically pulsating stars. And from their periodicity, we can deduce their absolute magnitude. And when we compare it to the apparent uh, magnitude that we observe, we can then deduce the distance. So using Cephates, we can measure quite some distances up to like 100 million light years. Uh, but if you want to measure distances even further away, we can't use Cephates anymore because our satellites are not um, able to pin down individual stars. And instead for even further uh, distances, we need to use supernovae. So supernovae are dying stars, but before they die, they give rise to this uh, giant um, uh, explosion and they become so bright uh, that they are sometimes even brighter than the entire host galaxy. And again, we can use their brightness in order to deduce the distance. So this distance information together with the redshift then allows us to determine the H0 parameter. So how can we measure H0 from the early universe physics, so to say, so from the cosmic microwave background? And for that, um, we need to assume a very specific model, like a lambda CDM model with its parameters. And then for that specific model, we have to um, compute what would be the linear cosmological perturbations. And so we um, uh, try to get the fluctuation information from our specific theory, and we compare it directly with the measured fluctuations from CMB. And then we um, compare our observables, the theoretical predictions of our observables to the data. And then we fit that. And in this way, in an indirect way, then, um, so in a model dependent way, we can, we can then obtain the H0 parameter. So what is then the, the problem? <laughs> so the problem is um, this H0 tension and you now take this uh, local measurements coming from um, like Cephates and supernovae. And if you compare it then for, with the measurements coming from the CMB, uh, there seems to be a, a quite large uh, tension in this H0 parameter. So there is a very different opinion in the literature uh, concerning this H0 tension. It could be due to um, systematics, um, especially in this distance measurements. Um, yeah, and but it could be also due to some new physics. Um, so, for the sake of the, the fall of my 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 uh, talk here, I will try to take this tension seriously, because otherwise I can just stop here and stop talking. Um, so let's take this H zero tension seriously, and then uh, and then we will address the question: um, How can we try to solve this H zero tension? Uh, trying to go beyond the lambda CDM model. And um, concerning the lambda in this lambda CDM model, so lambda is the cosmological constant, right? There is also uh, uh, quite a few theoretical obstacles to get actually a cosmological constant from quantum gravity. So this is just a side remark, uh, but it's uh, it's, it seems to be really very hard to get a cosmological constant or a distance space time uh, from quantum gravity. That could be also a, a, a theoretical um, motivation why one could try to, to go beyond lambda CDM and, and, and try to solve the H0 tension. Okay, so as I said, I, will, I would like to try the H0 tension seriously and then try to solve it. And, and there we can divide the solutions into early versus late time solutions. And then I will introduce in a quick format um, how these two solutions differ and what are the main differences, so to say. Okay, so what do we want? We want to increase H0. This is our goal in order to solve the H0 tension. And um, well, you could say, okay, then try just just increase increase the H zero tension, um, or the small h. So when you try to increase naively uh, within the lambda CDM model, for example, if you naively try to increase here your uh, H zero parameter, um, what happens is that your CMB peaks. This 
very uh, you know tight constraints that we have from CMB. These peaks of the CMB they get shifted towards the left, and then uh, and then you would be immediately ruled out by the CMB measurements. Um, and so the relevant uh, the relevant variable, so to say, the relevant scale, which is the acoustic scale. Um, is here given by this expression. So we have to make sure that this acoustic scale doesn't move away. So it stays where it is. And this basically represents the overall position of the peaks. And as you can see, it has two pieces. Uh, one is the sound horizon here, and then this is divided by the angular diameter distance. And now, uh, depending on um, whether or not you do, do you know, modify the sound horizon or the angular diameter distance, uh, this will distinguish between um, late time and early um, universe solutions. So what we want to achieve is to decrease this acoustic scale because we have increased the H0 and the increase of the H0 made that the peaks move to the left. And then now if we decrease the theta, this acoustic scale, if you decrease it, the peaks are moved back to the right, and then everything is okay again, we are happy, we are not ruled out by the CMB measurements. So when we look at the sound horizon, um, here is the expression of the sound horizon. And as you can see, it's an integral over the far uh, past infinity to the last scattering surface of the inverse Hubble function. So every early modification in the Hubble function is going to have an impact um, on the sound horizon. And similarly, if you look at the angular diameter distance here, this is then the integral from the last scattering surface to today of the inverse Hubble function. So any late time modification of the Hubble function is going to modify your angular diameter distance. So therefore, you have this um, two different type of solutions. So the early time solutions are those in which you decrease your sound horizon and therefore your acoustic scale is decreased. Or you, in the late time solution, you try to increase your angular diameter distance. So what we'll follow now in, in my talk um, is mainly be focusing on the late time solutions. So we will be having modification in the Hubble function in the late universe, which will give rise to differences in the angular diameter distance. Okay, so late time solutions. This is what I would like to focus from now on. And as I was saying, if you increase H0 uh, naively, this makes that the peaks of the CMB is shifted to the left. And now we would like to find uh, some new physics uh, such that the angular diameter distance is increased. And for instance, you can achieve that by having a dark energy equation of state sufficiently negative. When you push the equation of state uh, to negative values, um, then the peaks is pushed to the right again, which compensates the fact that the peaks were moved to the left by your increased H0. This, on the other hand, means that you need a phantom, phantom dark energy in order to solve the H0 tension using a late time solution. Okay, so let me maybe uh, just quickly give a concrete example of a successful covariant theory. Um, but later on, as I promised, I will do that in a model independent way. But sometimes it helps to have a concrete Lagrangian and then look at the equations concretely for this Lagrangian. Um, but I, this is just an example. There are a bunch of other uh, promising successful models. So this is based on a vector field, so generalized Broca theories. And they are constructed um, such that they satisfy certain theoretical conditions, uh, like second order equations of motion, Lorentz invariance, and locality. 
and three propagating degrees of freedom. And imposing this condition, you can um, write down the most general Lagrangian for such a massive vector field. And it was long believed that uh, if you have just one single vector field, that this would be in direct tension with the cosmological principle, so that you cannot have homogeneous and isotropic solutions with one single vector field, and therefore that this single vector field would not be appropriate for dark energy applications. But the generalized Broca initiated a radical change of view because now with the generalized Broca, you can have homogeneous and isotropic solutions in which the vector field um, acquires a background field configuration where you have a non-vanishing temporal component that has uh, time dependence. All the other components uh, at the background level are zero. For example, if you have uh, such a, a simple Lagrangian as a sub-Lagrangian from our previous uh, general Lagrangian, this Lagrangian is already enough um, to have, for instance, dark energy fixed point, which is relevant for a uh, late time universe. Um, and also we were able to show explicitly that it reduces the H0 tension and actually delivers a better fit to data than the Lambda CDM model. Um, we have done this analysis at the background level, but then um, together with Hector, uh, we also um, considered linear perturbations and um, plugged in this modification into the class and so developed the Boltzmann code for this very specific Lagrangian and studied also what the perturbations uh, give rise. And so here is a um, quick plot here. What you can see is um, omega CDM versus H0 and the gray is the lambda CDM. And then here you see the PROCA background plus perturbations and as you can see, the H0 value is pushed um, to the higher values um, in this generalized PROCA theories. And so at the background level, the reason why it helps with the H0 tension is because the equation of state is um, smaller than minus one. And at the perturbation level, um, uh, there are non-trivial contributions from additional uh, vector degrees of freedom. Um, is there a, is there a, yes. Lavinia, is this theory ghost free? Yes, this theory is completely ghost free. And so when I was talking about this theoretical conditions here, um, this is exactly um, achieved by making sure that you have only second order equations and three propagating degrees of freedom. And then you can promote those uh, to the curve space time and you obtain then vector tensor theories uh, with no ghost whatsoever. So the theory itself doesn't have any ghost. And then now when you look at very specific um, uh, background plus linear perturbations, also the perturbations themselves are completely ghost free. So there are no instabilities um, for this very specific um, example that I am showing here. So the, co the covalent theory is ghost free. And so it has three degrees of freedom in the massive uh, vector field and the two coming from the standard metric. And uh, uh, among these five physical propagating degrees of freedom, if you look at specific cosmological backgrounds like you, you looked here, um, there are no ghost instabilities. I think um, you asked this question because typically, uh, typical dark energy <clears throat> models, when they have phantom behavior, the perturbations suffer from ghost or gradient instabilities. And here, this is not the case. Okay. So um, then let me move on to the Sigma 8. Uh, parameter. This is also a very fundamental parameter in cosmology, apart from the H01. Um, so what is the sigma 8? Um, 
I was telling you about these pillars, GR and cosmological principle, and that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Of course, uh, this is not true because otherwise we would be really existing here. So there are small fluctuations um, from which we believe um, that all the structures formed in the universe. So now we have to introduce this um, small perturbations. And um, in other words, on top of our standard um, FRLW metric, we consider some perturbations uh, in the metric. And also on top of the matter background, we also consider perturbations of the matter field, which we can represent as some perturbations in the energy density and perturbations in the pressure. And um, there is one very important uh, quantity, and this is the matter over density. And as you can see, the matter over density is nothing else but the matter um, energy density minus the background uh, matter energy density divided by the matter energy density. So this plays really a very relevant role in order to see uh, how this um, how these over densities evolve in time and how structures are formed. So for example, if you look um, um, in the sky and you look at all these distributions of galaxies and imagine you, pit, you take a sphere of a radius, then you can ask yourself how much structures are within this radius R. And this is exactly what this over density is going to give you. Of course, if you, if, of course, if you zoom in more and more and more in this radius, uh, this would diverge. Therefore, um, you um, basically integrate it out. And when you do that, um, you can then use this now quantity and build statistics, for example, two point function. And this two point function then is, is this variance that gives you exactly this uh, sigma squared. And if you pick this radius to be eight megaparsec, you get the sigma eight parameter. And so one important um, question is then, what is the value of the sigma eight when we look in the sky and we, when we try to measure these structures in our universe, and then um, compare that with our, uh, with our favorite model, uh, which in this case is the Lambda CDM model. So how can we measure that? Again, we can uh, measure them directly um, in a model independent kind of way, just by looking at the galaxy surveys and counting really the structures in each, in each patch. Uh, or we can, uh, in an indirect way, in a model dependent way, um, again, assume for example, on the CDM and then deduce the observables, calculate them, uh, and compare these predictions to the CMB. And in this way, uh, you can then derive the sigma eight parameter in, in an indirect way. And here, what is the problem? Also, there seems to be a, a tension. Rather, I mean, it's small compared to a H0 tension. So when you compare the galaxy surveys, the measurements of galaxy surveys, uh, when you compare them with Planck, then you see there is also a, a gap between them. It's around like 2.5 sigma. Maybe it's, it's not that relevant compared to the H0 tension, uh, which was like around 4.5 sigma. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, let's again play this uh, Godankin experiment and take the sigma H tension seriously. And then ask ourselves, what would, what would we need to do in order to solve the sigma H tension? So as you see, SIMB not only yields, yields a lower H0, but also a higher sigma 8 value. And this is where all the troubles comes. <laughs> so what, we do, what do we want? We want to decrease sigma 8. So um, I showed you already these two versions between early versus late time solutions, what you need to do in order to increase H0. Now, when you do that naively, when you try to um, either um, decrease the sound horizon or inc in increase the angular diameter distance uh, in order to 
move the H0 to higher values, this typically uh, makes your zigmoid function worse. And so this is the problem. So it's really a quite challenge to improve the H0 tension, but not to make the zigmoid tension worse or better uh, make it actually also the zigmoid tension to, to improve. So for, for instance, the, the very specific generalized Broca theories that I was showing, which uh, helps with the H0 tension, um, in this very specific model, uh, they don't, it, it doesn't uh, fall in the same category that the, it makes the sigma H tension worse. So thanks, thanks God. So um, this model doesn't make the sigma H tension worse. Uh, it, it helps with the H zero tension, but it also doesn't improve the sigma H tension. At least with this uh, simple sub Lagrangian that we have considered. Okay. Uh, anyway, so this was just a uh, very concrete example. Uh, what I would like to do now in a systematic way um, is to answer this question. Could late time dark energy models solve the H0 and the sigma H tensions simultaneously? So, and this will be in a model independent way. So any late time dark energy model uh, without assuming any concrete uh, Lagrangian, what would you, you need to do in order to solve both tensions at the same time? So what we want is increase H0 and decrease sigma H. This is what we want to achieve. So as I said, our goal is to solve both tensions simultaneously and to solve them without assuming any model, but also without assuming any parameterization. Okay, there are also concrete models where they assume very specific parameterization. So I don't want to assume any parameterization or any model. And the reason is embedding into Boltzmann code is really very expensive. So imagine you have your favorite model and at the background level things seem to be okay, but then when you need to study the uh, linear perturbation, Embedding them into an existing Boltzmann code or develop your own code is, is really very expensive. And at the end, you have, you, you have done all this work to, to see that it doesn't work. So, um, so our goal was to try to find analytical conditions that your model has to satisfy in order to solve both a zero and sigma age tension at the same time before you go on and embed it into a, a specific Boltzmann code. This is also from experience. Uh, we were like studying a, a specific um, um, dark energy model with a scalar field and, and at the background level it was working fine, but then we have done all the work and embedded into the, the perturbations into Boltzmann code to just see that it doesn't work. So can we avoid this time consuming effort and very expensive effort using fully analytical um, uh, expressions and conditions? Okay, so in order to do that, we will do the following. So we will take Lambda CDM as an example. You can do this analysis for any um, background model that you would like to, but here we, we as an example, we stick to the lambda CDM. And we consider small deviations from this lambda CDM model. So lambda CDM has this six parameters. And because I'm interested in the late time uh, dark energy models, for me, essentially, these two parameters are going to be the relevant ones, the H0 parameter and then the omega matter. So at the background level, um, things are very easy. I have the uh, Friedman equation, right? And so I have the Hubble function uh, as a function of redshift from the lambda CDM. And there the effective gravitational coupling constant is simply the Newton gravitational coupling constant. And now what I want is I want to consider small deviation from such a 
uh, model at the background level. So I am adding some general functions of delta H of the Hubble function. And I could also even uh, introduce some general function of the effective coupling constant, delta J here. Okay, and this uh, small deviation in this uh, background functions, they will have immediate uh, deviations or changes in our fundamental parameters of the lambda CDM. So we will then have a shift in the H0 and the omega matter and so on, parameters of the lambda CDM due to these uh, deviations. Okay, so we have this general deviation from the lambda CDM. On the left-hand side here, we have the, uh, the, uh, the changes in the parameters due to the changes on the right-hand side of my uh, functions. Let me first concentrate um, just in changes, deviations in the Hubble function. Let me forget about the effective gravitational coupling constant. I will come to that uh, towards the end. So let me concentrate just some arbitrary general deviation in the Hubble function. And then my goal will be then try to compute the variations, the first order in the important observables, like the acoustic scale or the sigma eight or maybe other observable that we are interested in. So compute these variations of that of this observables in terms of changes in the Hubble function. And then the next step would be then to relate these deviations um, of these parameters with the deviations in my Hubble function. So I would like to make a relation between the left and side to the right hand side. So how do my cosmological parameters change by uh, this general deviation of the Hubble function? And in order to make this relation, we will use the CMB priors. So we will make sure that the peaks do not move around. And this will allow us to generate response functions uh, for a given observable that we are interested in. For example, if you are interested in the changes in the sigma eight, this will then be given by an integral over the changes of this Hubble function and then a very concrete analytical response function um, coming from this, uh, uh, this deviation of the, of the background equations. So the goal is to find analytically these response functions. And so as, as I was saying, I will concentrate here first on the changes in the double function, but you could also have changes in the gravitational coupling constant, and they will also give rise to, um, to a specific response function. Okay, so uh, for example, if you have a variation of the Hubble parameter. So we have this expression here. Uh, you have changes here in the um, in the Hubble parameter H zero, and then here are the deviations in the function of your background uh, Friedman equation. So our goal is going to be relate this one to this one, and then. We can, for instance, look at a very concrete uh, observable like the cool moving distance. We know that it has this type of dependence on the Hubble function. We can then now plug this change directly in here. And then this will give us the, the change in the cool moving distance uh, as a change in the Hubble function. Okay, so then we plug in this expression here. And as you can see, any uh, observable like the co-moving distance, will have two pieces in here. One is uh, given by the change in the Hubble parameter and then one given by the change of the expansion rate. So the change in any observable, so this was in our case uh, uh, the co-moving distance, but it could be any observable that I denote here with O, will have these two pieces. One coming from this piece, and one coming from that one. And this has a Z dependence. So this is an explicit integral with this uh, specific response function. 
So now we need to relate, as I said, the small delta H uh, with the big delta H with, with the expansion rate uh, changes. And we, we will do that by using a very tight and precise uh, priors coming from CMB, which is namely the, the, the acoustic scale, the peaks of the CMB. And we want to make sure that it doesn't move, move around. So in order to agree uh, with CMB observations, the acoustic scale needs to remain completely unchanged. And so when we look at changes delta theta, um, we have to make sure that this is zero and it doesn't move over around. Okay, so this is a theoretical condition that we are going to impose um, in order to be able to relate the small delta H to the big delta H. As you can see, the changes in the sound horizon will have these two pieces, and also the angular diameter distance will have these two pieces. And this relation, when we put it down to zero, allows us to solve the relation of delta H as the function of changes in the expansion rate. So when you do that, uh, you obtain here this expression where you know how your Hubble uh, parameter changes uh, with the changes in your expansion rate with a very specific uh, response function. Okay, so we have that. So what we can do is we can plug in this in here. And so this one we had uh, just constructed from using the CMB priors and therefore any observable now, um, ch any changes in an observable can then be written in this, in this form um, where this response function is constructed um, out of uh, out of this and that together. Okay, so let me give you a, a concrete example in order to show you how these response functions look like for the lambda CDM model. So if you want to have their concrete analytical form, you can have a look in the paper. Here I am showing the plot of this response function. So here we see the plot shows the response functions uh, with respect to redshift. In green, here in green, you see the response function um, of the Hubble parameter. And in red, you see the response function of the sigma eight parameter. And they have this very specific form. And so this very specific analytical form um, comes from your concrete cosmological background, which in our case was lambda CDM. And here it's very relevant to emphasize that both response functions are completely negative. And this has huge implications for solving the H0 and sigma H tension at the same time. So keep in mind, both response functions are negative. Is there a question? how a general response function is constructed. Is there an analytical form of A? So yes, these response functions are complete analytical functions of your background quantities. So they are really, uh, there's no numeric or whatever. This is really completely analytical function of your, of your background quantities. And so uh, their analytical form, I mean, they, they have some length, lengthy form, uh, it looks a little bit cumbersome, but they, they have been written in this paper. You can have a look uh, how, how concretely, what, what the specific structure, analytical structure, these response functions have. Okay, so these are the response functions for the Hubble parameter and then the sigma eight. And, um, and as I said, they are both negative. So please keep that in mind. So we have these two response functions. And um, now we can play the game and see what we need to do in order to solve both tensions simultaneously. So 
we have the response functions and remember this multiplies the changes in the uh, Hubble expansion rate. So this multiplies uh, some delta H. Imagine, we, so for this sake, I assumed a very specific form of delta H like that. So this was the important pieces in the integral. And now we take this and multiply it with the response function. When we do that, we obtain this dotted lines for the Hubble function, uh, for the Hubble parameter and for the sigma eight parameter. Um, so these are these uh, multiplications. And then we have to perform this uh, integrals over redshift. And this corresponds to this uh, volume in here. And they give rise to exactly the changes in the uh, Hubble parameter and here the changes in the sigma eight parameter. Sorry, this, this thing here disturbs. Where can be found exactly? <laughs> so there is a, there is in the appendix of this paper and uh, uh, I don't know if this is the archive number of the short or longer paper. Um, in the appendix of this paper, you can find the, the exact form of this, um, of this response functions. Okay, so now we want to solve um, this. Uh, we want to look at this response function and we want to solve H0 and sigma H tensions at the same time. So remember I told you the response function is negative. And if you multiply something negative with something else and you want to get something positive, this other thing has to be also negative. So that if you multiply negative negative, you get something positive. So solving the H0 tension requires that your delta H has to be negative, at least at some redshift. And this other, this in, uh, on the other hand, directly impl uh, implies that your equation of state of your dark energy has to be phantom light, has to be smaller than minus one. Okay, so this is a, as I said, in a, a complete model independent statement that whatever dark energy model you, you have, if you want to solve it with a late time uh, solution, um, the response function of lambda CDM is given by that. And you really need to have um, a delta H that is um, smaller, uh, smaller than zero, at least for some redshift. So this is solving the H zero tension. And now if, if, if these two are negative to give something positive, here, the response function of sigma eight is also negative. And if delta H was only negative, it would also give rise to something positive. But remember, we want to decrease sigma eight. So if we want to increase delta H and to decrease sigma eight, uh, we need to do something else with the delta H. So solving both tensions, assuming that the gravitational coupling constant is given by the Newtonian coupling constant, um, requires that this uh, delta H has to change sign uh, at some point. So it has to become positive so that something uh, uh, smaller can come from the sigma eight. So in other words, the equation of state has to cross the phantom divide, has to cross the minus one in order to, to really be able to solve both the H zero and sigma eight tensions at the same time. And so, okay, this is a solution. This is a theoretical condition or requirement that you could impose. Typically, uh, when, you, when you cross minus one um, and in your background, this gives rise to uh, instabilities in the perturbations. So you have to be a little bit careful. In order to circumvent that, in order to avoid that, you can actually also now consider deviations in the gravitational coupling cost. So now uh, in, the room, in the next couple of minutes or so, uh, let me consider um, a general effective gravitational coupling constant that is not the G Newton, but actually some uh, arbitrary general function that can have very specific uh, redshift dependence. So now I have both 
deviation in the expansion rate and also deviation in the gravitational coupling cost. And this has, of course, direct implication for our uh, matter over density, the quantity that we were interested in, because it gives rise to a different um, growth function coming from this deviation. And uh, therefore, for example, for the sigma h parameter, you would have um, the response function coming from the deviations in the Hubble function, and then the response function coming from the deviations of the uh, effective gravitational coupling constant. So you need to uh, consider both of these contributions. And remember, as I was saying, uh, this part typically uh, will increase um, if you don't allow that delta H change of sign. So if you don't allow uh, the phantom divide. Um, so if you keep delta H always um, smaller than zero and without allowing the change of sign, uh, this will actually increase your sigma H. So make your sigma H tension worse. Therefore, uh, you have to have a compensating effect from the changes in the effective gravitational coupling constant in order to uh, push down the value of the sigma H in order to solve the sigma H tension. And um, the theoretical requirement that you need to satisfy is given here, where this alpha is again a very specific response function in terms of your uh, background quantities, your Friedman background quantities of the lambda CDM model, and um, and your perturbations, your deviations of that lambda CDM model has to satisfy this condition. Um, here is the uh, plot of these response functions again for the lambda CDM um, for the changes in the in the effective gravitational coupling constant, and then here it's this. Um, this alpha function uh, as a function of uh, redshift, um, assuming that you have a lambda CDM as your uh, fiducial background model. Okay, so as I said, uh, let me then summarize solving H0 tension requires that your delta H has to be negative. In other words, the equation of state. Uh, has to be uh, smaller than minus one, so phantom-like. If you keep uh, the effective gravitational constant the same as the in lambda CDM, namely G Newton, solving both functions requires that delta H change the sign, and therefore the equation of state has to cross uh, the phantom divide. And this uh, typically have um, um, some theoretical um, issues and pathologies, especially at the perturbation level. And in order to avoid that, you can also allow for uh, deviations in the gravitational coupling constant. And therefore, you can then uh, keep um, delta H like this. And this then has direct, um, uh, gives us a true direct uh, master formula, so to say, between um, your deviation in the gravitational coupling constant and then in the Hubble function. And they have to satisfy this very specific condition uh, with this very specific response function that um, I have shown you. Okay, I think um, I, I stop here and then I take questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you for a very nice talk. Yes, Shaheen. Uh, thank you, Lavinia, for the uh, very interesting talk. Actually, I have a, a sort of general question, uh, which would be relevant to mainly to the first part of your talk, but also in, to the second part. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main question is actually, what does it mean to uh, have a solution to, uh, for example, H0 or SA tension? Uh, so we, we need to quantify this. Mm -hmm. And generically, uh, when we look into the late resolutions, uh, there is a limit uh, into which we can increase the value of H0. Mm -hmm. So the question I wanted to ask is, within your uh, Proko vector model, uh, what's the maximum value that you, you can increase the uh, H0? given the CMB plus supernova plus PAO data? Yes, yes. Um, so um, 
your question is very concrete, right? You say, what is the maximum um, value that you can have for H0 in general? Um, we haven't investigated that. We have looked only at this very specific sub uh, Lagrangian, you know, where you had just the G2 and G3 functions in the, in the Lagrangian. For this very simple Lagrangian, because we just wanted to not to have too many firms and operators, um, the H0 tension was uh, improved uh, like by two sigma or so. And, um, but you know, the general Lagrangian has many, many terms. And then one would need to take all, this, uh, all these different terms and then embed them into the Boltzmann code and then study the CMB um, perturbations together with the supernovae and so on in order to really tell you what would be the, the maximum amount of H0 that one could increase. And uh, of course, one can ask this similar question to the second part of your talk when you uh, also discussed S8. So uh, usually these models have a limit and uh, they can improve uh, uh, or if you want to call it solve uh, the tensions to some level, right? Of course, yes. Remember here, I am, uh, I am doing um, a small deviation on top of a lambda CDM, right? So because I am considering in order to get all this analytical response function. Um, so if you want to achieve a better, um, let's say better, better solution, which is really very far away from the lambda CDM, this wouldn't be encaptured. But mm -hmm. if you then are very far away from the lambda CDM, I am then not sure if you will be really um, in agreement with all the other, <laughs> with all the other measurements that you have. Exactly, that's the problem that usually one faces. Yes. Okay. So we have here only the specific response functions, but we didn't uh, impose further conditions like um, how much you would need to uh, change delta H by how much percentage in order to get, let's say, two or three sigma. Um, in the Hubble function or in the sigma eight, uh, in, in the Hubble parameter or sigma eight parameter. I mean, this was the first uh, analysis, uh, but that could be really very interesting to put further, um, to further like analysis and condition to say how much percentage of deviation you need in order, let's say, to get a more um, satisfying uh, sigma deviation from your cosmological parameters. And it may very well happen that we are out of the perturbative level you just discussed. Yes, it could, it could happen, yes. <laughs> no, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Luis? Yeah, so uh, thanks for this very beautiful talk and excellent piece of work, uh, analytic piece of work. Uh, the, the question I have is, uh, in this summary, for instance, mm -hmm. um, you you... At some point in the talk, you said you were going to specify to lay time solutions. Mm -hmm. So how these conditions will change if you use early time solutions? Have you investigated that? And yes, yes, excellent, excellent, problem? excellent questions. Um, yeah, so this is just late time and then we could do everything analytically. Um, if you go to early time, um, um, things that are a little bit more complicated and then you have to solve uh, uh, the quantities numerically. So we, we, we have done that. Um, so we are on, on, in, in progress of um, uh, trying to get specific uh, conditions for the early uh, universe physics or changes and what the implications would be. So this is a work in progress. Um, at least we have already our numerical version of the response functions, um, but but we haven't finished the work, so it's not published. So what is the problem? Why you cannot do it analytically? Uh, is it there any easy spot that you can distinguish between early and late that forbids the analytical solution? Yes, it's typically related to the sigma eight, right? So. Um, uh, the, the way how you get the sigma eight from the CMB uh, is basically like some some integral of your uh, linear perturbation that depends on your uh, background parameters. 
And in order to get the response function there, you have to really uh, numerically analyze analyze yeah. that. Okay. So it, it it comes from the from the sigma eight, not so much from the Hubble function. Okay, thank you. Very very nice piece of work, and I, I'm looking forward to to the new work coming out about the early early universe conditions. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, Ruth. Hi, Lavinia. Thank you for your very nice talk. Uh, Hi. I have a question concerning again also the sigma eight. Uh, actually, I have a question and a remark. You're certainly very well aware of that many people say so baryons are quite important for uh, for results from lensing, from weak lensing. So might sigma eight not be sig significantly the ones obtained by lensing measurements? significantly affected by baryonic physics, which we don't really master sufficiently well. And then co th there comes also my question, how did you do your uh, calculate your sigma 8? Was it linear perturbation theory? Was it some halo models? How is your yes. sigma 8 calculation? Done? Yes, yes, here is only the, uh, the linear growth, the growth function mm -hmm. from the linear perturbation. And, and then, as I was mentioning, we have only considered the CMB priors, right? The, uh, the measurements from the CMB. So yeah. you, you are absolutely right. Now you are also mentioning other observables like the lensing or, or, or other observables that, that will also then put even further tighter constraints on this, well, on this response well, function. What, what I ma meant was if baryons are important for the sigma from lensing, then if you don't take them into account when you when you uh, estimate your sigma eight uh, using the CMB priors, you don't take into account how baryonic clustering might modify sigma eight. Then maybe mm -hmm. the sigma eight which you calculate is not the one which is seen in the weak lensing measurements. So um, what you are saying has only implication on this conditions that we obtain and the conditions that we have mm -hmm. obtained here is no, not very um, tight constraint at this stage um, because we are just using the CMB priors. And remember mm -hmm. now when we also say, oh, there's all this important bionic physics that we need to take into account, then it will um, give even further restrictive uh, relations or like upper bounds or lower bounds on these response mm -hmm. functions. Um, which we didn't take into account, right? Here we have only the CMB observable, and of, of course, this has uh, um, some restricting power, but not that much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sayant. Hello. Uh, yeah, Madam, very good presentation. Thank you very much. So I had uh, one or two questions. So first question is that you have taken Poca field, right? I mean, the massive vector uh, field. So, but mm -hmm. the problem is that that is not gauge invariant, right? So mm -hmm. I mean, when you calculate in perturbation, even for field theoretic language, you would not have those what Takashi identity, et cetera, what you take, say, lot of perturbation to cancel out, right? Even say early cosmological, et cetera. So is that a problem taking, say, massive one? And so the polarization would be more than two, like mode? Because the gauge invariant is destroyed in massive focus, right? Yes, yes, sure. Um, but this has no, this is no implications in the sense that, um, of course, I am explicitly breaking the gauge symmetry, and therefore I have three propagating degrees of freedom. Hmm. Um, but I am actually using this um, additional degrees of freedom in order to mimic the dark energy. Um, I mean, it, you could even use it for dark matter, but I was interested in, in dark energy. Now, at the, uh, let's say, quantum fluctuation level, imagine you are interested in uh, how those fields fluctuate. And then you can, within the effective field theory, um, quantize this, these fields. Um, so you don't have the word identities, uh, like in the same way of, of the gauge fields, but you're, you can derive all your Feynman rules, and then you can compute all your, let's say, first or second loop uh, contributions. And actually, we have looked at the uh, uh, concrete quantum corrections that you would get from such a vector field. And we could show that the 
classical effective field theory Lagrangian is completely stable um, and blind to the quantum corrections. I don't know if you are worried about that or yeah, actually, I'm I worried understood. that, I mean, for example, when, say, people do, say, Zeldovich effect or like Sackles effect in quantum field theory, in early universe, of course, you are probably working in late universe. So there they explicitly use the, I mean, what Takashi identity in E1 gauge, right? Electromagnetic QED sure, identity, sure. etc. Sure, but the reason so why So that they... you cannot get anymore, right? I mean, that's what I was yes, wondering. Yes, those QED exactly. Identities. But this the reason why they consider that is because if you, if you take single vector field, Mm -hmm. Just single PROCA, you cannot have inflationary solution. This is the reason why in the past people haven't considered that. Uh, but if you take now generalized PROCA and you have an inflationary um, solution, like an ex accelerated expansion, and you look at the perturbations, you can explicitly show that all the vector, vector perturbations decay away. So they don't dis disturb your, let's say, isotropy or whatever. Uh, okay. And my second question was related to that. I guess there is a no-go theorem if you go only by scalar field, right? You cannot cross from phantom to, I mean, like a, a quintessence, right? I mean, from omega equals to minus one to plus one, if you do the perturbation way, I mean, as you probably said. So was that the motivation to take some uh, say Proca equation or spin one uh, equation? Or was that a motivation that uh, say one scalar field cannot, uh, I mean, make a quantum field or something like that? I mean, that's what I was asking just. Yes, so uh, you see there are also like um, within scalar fields, you can do a bunch of other stuff like you could also couple it to dark matter. So there are like coupled uh, scalar fields, which um, due to the coupling, they can like uh, uh, push dark matter content into dark energy and then try to solve the, the tension in this way. Um, but then when you look at the perturbation, you see they, they typically uh, spoil your ISW and, and, and things like that. So um, the reason why we consider the vector perturbation is really, uh, sorry, vector theories is really uh, with a very simple Lagrangian, you can get this in a very quick and natural way and the perturbations don't suffer from any, any instabilities. So I guess this was the, this was the motivation. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And uh, just like last uh, comment rather, that you are actually saying that the if we take the G itself to be changed, we can do oh, both of them solve simultaneously, right? Both H0 and sigma, it's something. Uh, so yes. I guess branch decay theory also tied that if you have a scalar field like those uh, Dirac or your large number hypothesis, you can change the G. So would you say that the change of the G happens because of the field, like, if, like just like the branch decay theory expects that, I mean, G should change, but I guess that there was no significant change from the CMB and isotropy, et cetera. So, I mean, how serious the changes of G is necessary for solving both of them? I mean, is it really necessary or is it just a proper theory also can affect, yeah. So, yes, that, thank you for the question. So, um, of course, here we didn't uh, specify this is model independent uh, general function of this uh, G, G effective, right? And so this can be um, anything. And uh, you mentioned the brand sticky. Yes, brand sticky will then give rise to very specific delta G. And so, for example, if you have brand sticky and you are interested in whether or not it can solve both tensions simultaneously, uh, you compute your um, uh, from your very specific model, your background uh, quantities and your linear perturbations. And then you will uh, compare uh, if, like given your model, whether or not they satisfy this theoretical condition uh, with this very specific uh, response function. If they don't satisfy it, then it means that it was not sufficient um, changes in the effective coupling to solve both tensions simultaneously. Changes in the effective gravitational coupling concept is not necessarily if you allow for dark energy that uh, actually crosses the phantom divide, like here in this case, uh, but there typically you will run into some uh, pathologies that the perturbation level, that they uh, that they will suffer from some instabilities, and this is the reason why um, I was saying that uh, in order to solve both tensions in a theoretically consistent way without any pathologies and stabilities, 
you would need to satisfy this condition in here and allow for changes in the uh, effect of gravitational coupling. Yeah, thank you very much, ma'am. Also a beautiful presentation, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know, Maria, can you read the question? So, yeah, maybe we can read it. Um, so, where can we find it? Only the PRD version has appendix, if I am not mistaken. Thanks. Yes. Um, Yes, I, I, uh, we wanted to update the archive version, um, but I think the um, the long uh, the long PRD paper should have the appendix in it, and um, and we wanted to update the archive to the public version in order to really have everything completely there. It, it could be that maybe the archive version doesn't have the full uh, full analytical expressions. But but thanks for reminding. I will I, I will update the archive. I I couldn't find the analytic expression of the response function sigma head in this paper. Okay, I think this refers to the same thing. Yes, um, the um, the response functions for all of this uh, Hubble function. I mean the Hubble parameter and the sigma eight. Um, it, it could be that is not in the in the archive version, but uh, yeah, I will push them so that that you guys have that ex exact expressions. Do this criteria also apply to the interacting uh, dark energy model? So here we didn't assume anything about the dark energy, right? Uh, so um, this also includes the the interacting case. Whatever interact, interacting dark energy model you are considering, it will give rise to a very specific deviation in the Hubble function. And this, on the other hand, will have exactly this implication for your cosmological parameter like uh, H0, et cetera. So this also includes the interacting dark energy model. Um, we have also another question, Yashi. Hi, um, Lavinia. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I have one question which may be similar to the previous one, but still for clarification. The conditions mm -hmm. that are listed on the summary slide for solving both the tensions simultaneously, is it like the minimum criteria they should satisfy? Uh, in the sense, I want to ask that if there is a model which uh, uh, has all the three conditions, say delta H changes sign, as well as a phantom divide, uh, phantom crossing, as well as the G effective variation also follows. So in that case, can we also say that, okay, both the uh, both the tensions will be uh, resolved or in the positive direction? Um, so I, I guess um, th this is fine, right? This first uh, summary yeah. is just saying that if you have that, you need something that is um, negative. Yeah. And mm -hmm. between these two cases, uh, it's really either this one or that one, it's not gonna be at the same time. So okay. you will either try to solve your uh, both tensions uh, with the dark energy model that uh, crosses the phantom divide, or you don't allow that at all in your dark energy model, but then you would need to have um, deviations in your G effective. Otherwise you cannot solve the uh, Zigma H tension because, um, um, because this, uh, this thing here, is the response function is negative and then the sigma eight would just increase would be, you would make your sigma eight tension worse. Okay. Uh, I Again, I just meant that if we have both the uh, conditions satisfied for both the cases, the last two cases, like we have delta H changes sign as well as phantom crossing also happens as well as a variation in delta G. Mm -hmm. uh, will such a model also resolve both the tensions? Sure, sure. It it will resolve both tensions. Yeah. Um, oh. It will just have um, the same pathology <laughs> as okay. I was mentioning here. Yes, with with each of them, you can you, you solve that, and having both would definitely allow it. 
Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. And one more last question. Uh, is there any intuitive way of understanding why the early or late time solutions for the H0 worsen the sigma 8? Uh, is it like some physical reasoning or it's just the data analysis from which one concludes that, okay, other one is getting worsened? Uh, you mean like the whether the early deviation is always yeah. worse? The no, I yeah. mean if you if you have a specific model that mm -hmm. uh, so are you are you talking about the sigma h tension that it becomes worse? Yes, yes. Why why sigma h get worsened uh, in some of the cases where h naught is resolved? Yes. Um, so uh, typically, like typically, um, if you want to try to. Uh, um, decrease or increase your sound horizon or angular diameter distance, you do that by introducing additional degrees of freedom. It could be an additional scalar field, or it could be an additional vector field, or it could be even additional tensor field, like in biogravity. It doesn't matter. It, it's always some additional degrees of freedom. And this additional degrees of freedom, they will add to, because they give rise to perturbations, they will add to your clustering. And so whenever you have additional degrees of freedom, they will contribute uh, to your clustering and therefore you will, you will increase sigma eight. So you have to do really something um, uh, unusual <laughs> in order for compensate uh, such clustering effects. For example, if you have vector field in which you have one longitudinal contribution and two transfers, uh, the transverse modes can give rise to repulsive forces. And then this could uh, um, act against clustering, and and then it needs to satisfy certain conditions in order to achieve that. But quite generally, if you have additional degrees of freedom, uh, it gives rise to higher clustering, and therefore it makes it worse. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? No, so I think we can thank Lavinia again. Thank you for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, yes, I hope uh, you will have uh, a little bit of sunny summer um, apart from the cold weather that you had in Munich. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye.